Okay, perfect. And then as soon as I hit start webinar, I'll have you go ahead and share your screen. Okay. So then that way they have that up and everything. Okay. I'll just do that now. Yep. So it's Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We will get started here in about two minutes just to give time for everyone else to be able to get into the webinar too. We'll give it about one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Well, good morning again and welcome everyone. And thank you for participating in today's webinar, Hope and Understanding, a guide to supporting those with Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm Jenny Tukeski, the Programming and Communications Manager here at the Better Business Bureau, Midwest Plains. Just to let you know, we are recording today's webinar and later on we will send you a follow-up email with a link to the webinar as well as um, attach the presentation for you and any helpful links as well will be in that email for you. Um, just to let you know, our special guest today is Sadie Hinkle, who is the program director at the Alzheimer's Association Nebraska chapter. She earned her bachelor's degree in English education from Morningside University and then went on to continue to receive her master's degree in writing from Coastal Carolina University. Sadie has extensive experience working with public education and advocacy. She is passionate about providing and enhancing care and support for those affected by Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. She joined the Alzheimer's Association in February of 2024 and currently works managing educational programs, support groups, and more. Today, during the webinar, the purpose of this is to raise awareness of Alzheimer's and dementia, inform the community of Alzheimer's Association resources, and engage people in the Alzheimer's Association's mission. We ask that if you have any questions, to please go ahead and put them in the Q&A section. And at the end of the presentation, we will answer all of their questions then. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Sadie, thank you so much for joining us. And it is all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jenny. I'm excited to be here this morning um, and you know, talk about the impact of Alzheimer's and dementia in our community. I always like to start with our mission statement of the Alzheimer's Association because, you know, as you heard from Jenny's lovely introduction, I'm relatively new to the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I started in just this past February. And so since I've started and, you know, really got into my work at the association, something that has has really motivated me and guided me and honestly kind of surprised me is our mission statement. So our mission statement um, is to lead the way to end Alzheimer's and all other dementia. And our vision statement is a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Before I started my work at the Alzheimer's Association, I didn't even really think that that was possible. And so now that I've been in my role for a couple months here, 
it's, you know, so cool to know that it is, and it's something I'm working towards every day. And anyone who works at any Alzheimer's association across the country is, you know, working towards that same goal of ending the disease and all other dementia. Um, and so that's a big ask. That's a big task. How do we do that? There are a couple of different things we focus on at the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, number one, we accelerate global research. Uh, we are the number one funder of Alzheimer's disease or research across the country, across the globe, actually. Um, and it's something we're really proud of is, is how we're, you know, advancing that global research. We also are really passionate about driving risk reduction and early detection. Um, so that means getting people to talk about the disease, getting people to notice those warning signs of the disease earlier on, so that way they can live better with the disease or another dementia. Um, and then we also, like I said, with risk reduction, we talk about how can we inform people early on about the disease and other dementia in order to reduce their risk of getting dementia? So those are things that as you know, programming, I work quite a bit on, but I also really work on this last part of our mission statement here, which is maximizing quality care and support. So you know, we work on research, we work on education and information, but we also just work on providing that immediate support that people need. So we have a 24 seven helpline that caregivers can call, that people living with the disease can call. Um, maybe someone has questions about warning signs in themselves or loved ones, they can call that helpline. So we provide support that way, but we also provide support in the form of education programs like this and educating people but also actual support groups. So, um, you know, here in Nebraska, which is where I'm located, I oversee the support groups in Nebraska, but we have support groups across the country in person and virtual. And, you know, it's really cool just to provide those individuals with immediate support. So that's, you know, <laughs> a very brief overview of what the Alzheimer's Association does. Um, when anyone brings up the word Alzheimer's, dementia, you know, oftentimes I see people physically and, and metaphorically too get really tense because these things are often hard to talk about. So I'm really passionate about, you know, opening up these conversations and working to break away the stigma that the disease has. Um, and, you know, kind of the first step of doing that is talking about what the disease is and how we should talk about it, right? What the words actually mean. So um, I'm gonna start with just the general definition of dementia. You'll oftentimes, and maybe you do this yourself, but you often hear dementia and Alzheimer's disease used interchangeably, right? Um, they're very similar, but there are differences. So dementia is an umbrella term for loss of memory and other thinking ability abilities um, that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. So dementia, again, is that umbrella term, general term for memory loss um, and changes in thinking, reasoning, and behavior. That's dementia. The reason why we hear Alzheimer's and dementia used so interchangeably is because Alzheimer's disease makes up about 60 to 80% of all dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. Dementia is an umbrella term. Alzheimer's disease is that specific disease that is a form of dementia. Um, but just because someone has dementia does not necessarily mean they have Alzheimer's disease. There's lots of other forms of dementia as well. There's vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, which um, if you've been following Bruce Willis and his story at all, he was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia. Um, and there's, there's lots of other dementia out there too. Sometimes dementia can come from, you know, more than one cause. Um, sometimes dementia can come from a traumatic brain injury when maybe someone has a traumatic brain injury and then because of that, they have memory loss. Um, so dementia, again, that umbrella term, Alzheimer's disease is that specific disease that makes up most of the dementia cases that we see. So what is Alzheimer's specifically? Like I already said, it's a brain disease. We know that. Um, and we know that Alzheimer's as a disease 
affect people's memory, thinking, and behavior. What happens with the Alzheimer's disease is because it's a progressive disease, symptoms gradually worsen over a number a number of different years. You know, right now is what I like to say because we're working toward a cure every day, but right now Alzheimer's disease is a fatal disease, um, which means the disease progressively gets worse and, you know, eventually will become fatal. In the early stages of the disease, memory loss is typically pretty mild. As that disease progresses though, um, you know, that person will need more and more care up until the point where they need total around the clock care. Early on in the disease, um, you know, Alzheimer's disease works on a continuum. So early on in, in the disease, like I said, it's mild symptoms. Um, people might forget some things and I'll go through the warning signs here in a second too and go into that a bit, but it might start with simple memory loss, but by the end of the disease, you know, our brain is in control of so much of our body. So eventually the brain will forget or not know how to eat, how to chew, how to swallow, you know, how to regularly use the restroom, when to take in water, those types of things. So ultimately the disease is fatal. Um, and, you know, I always like to imagine this too, or not imagine, but think about it in the scientific way that Alzheimer's disease works, which, you know, the likely culprit of Alzheimer's disease are what is, you know, the lay person term is plaques and tangles. So there's a buildup of certain pro of a certain protein in our brain, um, much like, you know, an artery in your heart that that protein builds up in the pathways in your brain. And because of that blockage and that plaque that's built up in your brain, your memories can't get through. And then another protein sort of tangles up and provides, or, you know, makes those blockages as well. And so that's, like I said, a very lay person, you know, not super scientific um, explanation of what's happening in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, because those memories can't get through because of the blockages, brain or, you know, brain neurons die and the brain actually starts to shrink. Um, so, you know, I always like to say that because maybe, you know, someone living with the disease, you know, me, myself, I had a grandmother who was just the sweetest, kindest person. Um, oh, she died from the disease when I was in high school. And I found myself, even though I knew she had Alzheimer's disease, I found myself getting frustrated when she would say the same thing to me over and over and over again. And so I always like to put it in the perspective of this is, you know, obviously not their fault, but their brain is actually shrinking. They're, you know, losing parts of themselves. So if you know someone with the disease, there's a lot going on in their brain. So just try to be as patient as you can. So let's talk about populations at a higher risk. Um, Black Americans are about twice as likely as white Americans to have Alzheimer's or another dementia. And Hispanic Americans are about one and a half times as likely to have the disease. You know, we don't know for sure 100% why that is. Likely it is because of the health gaps and disparities that we see. Um, in underserved communities. So, you know, our scientists are still looking into that exactly, but likely that is the cause. And then this last point here is that almost two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's are women. Again, we're looking into the genetics of that and why that may be, but likely it is because women live longer than men. Um, and the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. So when you have more women, living than men living, it makes sense that more of them are living with Alzheimer's disease. And we know that Alzheimer's disease and other dementia impacts families greatly. You know, obviously I can't see everyone, but if I were to ask you all who knew, if you knew someone with Alzheimer's disease, it is likely that most of you would raise your hand because this is something that affects nearly everybody I know. Um, typically everyone in the room at least knows someone living with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. This is what happens, you know, and this is a good thing. People are living longer, but this is what happens when we have a big aging population in our country, right? Because people are living longer, more of them are living with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So 
you know, that can take a very physical, emotional, social, and, you know, definitely financial toll on families, caregivers, especially, and most caregivers are women. And about a third of dementia caregivers are daughters. So, you know, this is really falling hard on women, on young women who are daughters or just general caregivers for their family. Um, a couple other facts here is that 83% of the help provided to older adults comes from family members. Um, that care is valued at $271 billion. So if you think about the fact that these people are caregivers, you know, oftentimes toward the end of someone's uh, journey with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, they need that around the clock care. So their caregiver might have to stop working, um, might have to significantly, significantly cut back on their hours. And so this is costing us a lot of money when we think about it that way too. Um, and 70% of the cost of caring for someone with dementia comes directly from the families, either through out-of-pocket health care and long-term care expenses, or just the value of unpaid care. So this is costing people a lot of money. It's costing our country a lot of money. And, you know, it's something that we're working at every day because we would love to provide more caregivers with the support that they need. Okay, something I always you know, love to talk about to just general community members is the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, I'm getting older every day. Obviously we all are, we can't, we can't unfortunately stop that. But even as what I would say is a younger person, I think it's so important for everyone, no matter your age, to notice and learn these warning signs because it's often not the person living with the disease who notices the disease in themselves. It can be, and sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's their daughter, it's their son, it's you know their nieces, their nephews, um, it's their their significant other, it's their spouse. So. Noticing these warning signs and learning these warning signs plays a huge role in early detection, not only for yourself, but for people in your life as well. So this is always the, the part of the presentation that I get lots of questions about. So feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. I will be more than happy to answer them as best I can, but I am going to go through some of these warning signs. So the first warning sign listed here is the one that you probably think of when you think of someone living with dementia, and that is memory loss that disrupts daily life. The important thing to note here is that memory loss is chronic. It is happening to the point where it is affecting someone's day-to-day -day activity. So I always like to give the example um, because, you know, when I started in this job and I was looking into all of these warning signs, I think it's natural to maybe worry a bit, um, which I did, um, especially as someone, you know, who has had the disease run in my family. I am also the most forgetful person ever. I always joke and give the example of when I was in high school, my parents made four copies of my car keys because I just, I always lost my car keys. Um, so my, we had a, my mom had a copy of, uh, of my keys. My dad had my keys. There was a pair of a copy of my keys hanging up at home. And then I had car keys. So, you know, that has been something that has just been part of my personality. Some of these things, like some people are just forgetful people that does not mean that they have Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So keep in mind with that first warning sign there, it's memory loss that disrupts daily life. Um, so things maybe that they used to be able to do that suddenly they can't do anymore and it's affecting them day to day. Number two here is challenges in solving problems. And number three is difficulty completing familiar tasks. So this might look like maybe this person has always made this specific recipe and suddenly they're forgetting the steps to the recipe. Maybe they didn't even need a recipe um, before and now they they have to rely on something written to make the dish that they've made for a very long time. Maybe they put in weird ingredients into that recipe that shouldn't go in. Um, 
maybe they get in the car for their six month dental appointment that they have been going to, you know, every six months for years and years, and they get in the car and suddenly they don't know how to get to the dentist. That kind of memory loss um, would be a warning sign for dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, another is confusion with time or place and trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. So confusion with time and place is always different than, you know, it's totally normal. I do it quite often to walk into a room and think, what did I come in here to do? Why am I in this room again? And then, you know, eventually you remember, or you leave the room. If you're like me, you leave the room. And then five minutes later, you think, oh yeah, that's why I went in the room and you have to go back. Um, that is a normal age related change. Dementia confusion with time or place is, is a bit different. So I always give the example of my grandmother. We had, you know, this big trip to Disney world plan. We went to Disney world. I was in Disney with my grandma and we were at a store on May in main street in magic kingdom. It was, you know, it was so clear that you were in Disney world, right? We were shopping and she pulled out a pulled out um, a sweatshirt that had Mickey Mouse on it. Um, you know, that said Walt Disney World on it. And she turned to me and she said, Sadie, wouldn't this be so great for our trip to Disney? Um, and I, you know, of course said, yes, it would, you know, we should get it. But she, that's a different kind of confusion with not knowing where you are at all. You know, sometimes people will think a couple days has passed instead of a couple weeks. Um, or, you know, they just don't know in general what's going on, where they are. And then trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships um, is, you know, an eyesight thing. So sometimes someone's depth perception is really thrown off. Um, this can show up a lot of times in driving. They maybe stop at a stop sign, hopefully way before the stop sign, but sometimes after the stop sign, right, because it affects vision as well. Uh, new problems with words and speaking or writing. So sometimes it's hard, you know, anyway, sometimes to think of the word you're trying to say, but especially for people living with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, those words don't come to them sometimes ever. And so um, instead of calling some uh, a watch a watch on your wrist, they might come up with a new term for it, like um, a wrist clock because they can't think of that word watch. Uh, next is misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. So this is something, you know, that is always kind of comforting to me as a chronic worrier of if I have the disease or not. If you misplace something and you're able to retrace your steps, then that is not really a warning sign in the way of, you know, as it would be if I were to misplace something and then not be able to retrace my steps at all. If I misplace something, if I lost my car keys, for example, and I go to my car and I don't even know that I need keys to start the car, that would be more of a warning sign um, and not being able to retrace steps at all. Decreased or poor judgment. You know, so oftentimes that comes out in hygiene um, or financial decisions. Maybe someone starts to spend a lot of money uh, because their judgment has decreased or they have poor judgment. Um, withdrawing from work or social activities. You know, it's really hard when your brain doesn't come up with those conversation topics you want it to. It's really difficult when you meet someone that you know you should know and you feel awkward having that conversation with them because you don't know who they are. Because of those, you know, social awkwardness and fears, oftentimes people living with dementia or memory loss withdraw from work or social activities because they want to avoid that anxiety and embarrassment. And then finally, changes in mood or personality. This is different. And I should say too, in all of these, you know, maybe someone has one warning sign, maybe they have multiple, but each person's each person living with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia, their journey is completely different from the person next to them living with the disease. It looks different in everybody um, and everyone's mood is different, but oftentimes the mood changes look like anxiety, aggression, anger, um, you know, more of what we would cons typically consider those negative mood swings. 
And so, like I said, it's so important for me to talk about those warning signs because now more than ever, early detection is so crucially important to, you know, just living with Alzheimer's disease. So I always encourage everyone to pay attention to changes in memory, thinking, or behavior that you notice in yourself or someone else. Um, and it can be a hard thing to do, right? I, you know, think of my family and, you know, we probably started to notice those changes in my grandma a bit earlier than we felt comfortable talking to her about it, right? It went on for a little bit because, not because it made her uncomfortable, but it, because it made us uncomfortable because it's scary. Um, but the sooner you notice those warning signs, the sooner you notice those changes in memory, the better. The sooner you can have a conversation with that person, the better. Um, so, you know, if you see changes that are new or unusual, we encourage everyone to take action by talking to them by talking to a trusted family member who can talk to them or, you know, going with them and having a conversation with their doctor. Again, it can be scary, but the fact of the matter is it's not going away. And so the sooner that you can follow up with a doctor, the more benefits you can get. And so the benefits of early detection include the ability for that person to plan for the future. So before that person's disease, if it's Alzheimer's disease, uh, progressive, it's best to catch it early on so they can be involved in the planning process. Um, another huge benefit to early detection is it allows them to explore more treatment options. Some of the treatment, and we've had lots of great new advances in treatment surrounding Alzheimer's disease, but some of those treatments only can work or only can be diagnosed if the disease is caught in the early stages of the disease. So that's a huge benefit to early detection and just knowing those warning signs. Um, it also allows people to participate in clinical studies. And like I said, it involves the person with dementia in that really important process of decision making. So that way, you know, someone else isn't having to make those decisions for them, you know, years down the road. So I talked a little bit about treatments. Um, first, I always like to say I'm a doctor. You don't are I'm not a doctor. I should say I'm not a doctor. You don't want me to be your doctor. Um, but you know I can talk generally about treatments. And so if you have any specific questions, there is this website here. Our home office has so many resources on treatments. Um, you know, currently there are no medications that can cure Alzheimer's disease. It still is, like I said, that fatal disease. We're working towards that cure every day, but there are treatments that change disease progression, which is really exciting because this is the first time, this did not exist when my grandma had the disease. This is the first time where we have treatment that not only you know helps treat sy symptoms, but attacks the root cause of the disease and changes disease progression. Um, so, there's treatments like that. There's also drug and you know non-drug options that help symptoms, like I said. So really help lower memory loss and confusion. And really what this treatment in general is intended to do is help people live longer and better with the disease. Um, and they can be administered as a pill, as a patch, you know, through an IV. And everyone's experience with the disease is different. And so the doctors, you know, will, you know look at each specific case. Not every medication is effective for everyone, but the exciting thing is we're living in the era of treatment, which is, is still relatively new in the past few years and is really exciting. Um, and like I said, every day I know that we get closer to that cure as well. There are, oops, there are also, like I said, non-drug things that we can do, right? So the really great thing that has come out of research surrounding dementia is that we now know that there are several risk factors for cognitive decline in dementia. Some of them we can't control. Like I said, we all get older. If we could stop that, I know we all probably would. Um, but there are things that we can control to improve our brain health and that you know lowers our risk of cognitive decline and possibly dementia. So I will say what I, that you know, the tips I'm about to say are 
pretty common sense. I look at that list and I think, yeah, this is what my, you know, sixth grade health teacher taught me and how to take care of my body. Um, overall, what is good for the heart is good for the brain. So, you know, when you think about the fact that a lot of your blood flow, I think it's 80% of your blood flow from your heart goes directly to your brain. It makes sense that if we take care of our heart, we're also taking care of our brain. They're so closely connected. Um, and so a lot of these will are things that are just good for your heart, but there's also, you know, brain specific activities that you can put in place to help lower your risk of dementia. Um, the first is first couple here are to stay in school and challenge your mind. So school doesn't have to be, you know, you go back and get another degree, although certainly that is very good for your brain most of the time. Sometimes it can be stressful, um, but staying in school is so great for you because it allows you to learn something new every day. So anytime you're learning new information, our brain loves that. Um, it's really good because it's, you know, reigniting some of those pathways with new information, which is really great. Um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, an official school. It could be a pottery class, um, a knitting class, you know, any anything where you're learning something new. And obviously that goes along with challenging your mind as well. Um, I always tell people, and obviously I'm guilty of it myself as well, Sometimes I just spend hours and hours scrolling and, you know, the excuse I kind of give sometimes is like, oh, my brain is learning something new, but most of the time it really isn't. It's things I already know. Um, so make sure you do something non-digital every day that challenges your brain. Um, and again, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So get moving, eat healthy. Um, the, the two diet recommendations that the Alzheimer's Association makes for brain health is number one, the Mediterranean diet, and which is, you know, healthy, healthy protein. So lean meats, um, lots of veggies, um, olive oil instead of butter. So reducing the fat, that kind of thing. Um, so the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet is the two the Alzheimer's Association recommends. And that, you know, can help you maintain a healthy weight. Same with controlling your blood pressure and managing diabetes. Um, another great way to protect your brain is to literally protect your brain and wear a helmet. Um, or, you know, if you're involved in any sport, make sure you wear proper head, head gear and head, head protection. Uh, sleep well. So we know through several studies that the more people sleep and the better sleep they get, the better that is for our brains. And then of course, be smoke free. So someone who smokes is more likely to develop dementia than someone who isn't. Um, but if someone quits smoking, then their risk of developing dementia goes back to the same odds as if they never smoked at all. So it's never too late or too early to integrate these healthy habits. Um, and, you know, by learning those warning signs, by making concerted efforts to take care of our brains and our bodies, we're doing a lot in that fight against the disease. And so let's say you have really specific questions um, or you just want to learn more about Alzheimer's and other dementia, the Alzheimer's Association is here to help. So like I said, we offer that 24 seven helpline. It's available around the clock, 365 days a year. It's free of charge. And what's really great is on the other end of the line, you'll always get a person, number one. And that person is a master's level, um, you know, trained employee of the association who can answer any question. I've heard people call and ask about how they can get their mom to go to sleep because it's 3 a.m. and she's just pacing. Or I've heard people, you know, call and ask just about general warning signs. So we cover anything and everything on the helpline. So I always like to, use, you know, let people know about that resource. And we also, like I said, offer free education and support. So maybe you want to learn more. This is just our general awareness presentation I'm giving, but we have a specific presentation about the 10 warning signs. We have a specific presentation about understanding the disease. We have caregiver topics. We really have anything that you're looking for. So, you know, if you're thinking that you want to learn more 
and you want to schedule a presentation for your staff, maybe for your family, for your church, we give programs, you know, really anywhere and everywhere across Nebraska. And I'd be happy to work with you on that. We also host uh, two huge events for Alzheimer's disease research. That's our walk to end Alzheimer's and the longest day. So if you're interested in getting involved in those, please let me know. And, you know, just in general, everyone can play a role in being an awareness champion for Alzheimer's disease. I encourage you to share your personal story if you have a connection to the disease. I encourage you to just talk about the disease um, and really work to break down the stigma. The more people that talk about this disease, the better it is for everyone. Um, and like I said, feel you're welcome to join us in our walk or, you know, you can call our helpline anytime. We have lots of great staff members who would love to help you out. And a quote that, you know, I typically like to end on is do things here and now, not after you're gone. If you have some money, share it. And if you have some time, do something worthwhile. And that's from our founding president. And I think it's so important to just enjoy or try as much as you can to enjoy every moment. Um, and I th think that the same thing is true if you're living with the disease, if you know someone with the disease, really you have no option but to take things moment by moment, right? And so I think that's something we really can learn is how can we engage in each single moment that we're living and how can we use our time to do something worthwhile? So with that, I have about nine minutes, I think, Jenny, right? And so I will leave some time open for questions. Thank you so much, Sadie. And again, if you ah. have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section and we can get to them for you. Um, I guess the first question I have is, is there a typical age range when dementia or Alzheimer's sets in? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> You're the I have a bad answer, which is not really. <laughs> um, anyone can be affected by the disease. You know, I've heard of someone in the early stages of the disease when they were in their 30s. Um, typically, though, I guess there is a typical age, and that typical age is 65 or older. Um, you know, people can get it certainly after they're 65, but we start to see increases in diagnosis and, and, you know, people noticing those signs around age 65. Okay. And then I guess second part to that, then is it a disease that e the younger generation, especially like kids could ever develop and get to? Not that we know of now. Um, so there are certain risk factors for the disease. Age is that number one risk factors. Risk factor, family history is another genetic risk factor. Um, and so there are two types of genes that live in someone with Alzheimer's disease, or it could be, I suppose. So the first is just the risk gene, which means, you know, if you have that gene, you're at a higher risk of getting the disease, but there's also a gene that's called the deterministic gene. So if someone is living, let's say someone is five years old and they're living with that deterministic gene, that means they will get Alzheimer's disease. The good news is everyone living with Alzheimer's disease, there's a, only a very, very small portion of them who have that deterministic gene. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's one or 2% of people living with the disease. So it's a very, very small chance, um, but likely that disease won't manifest or show up until that child is an adult, often when they're 65 or older. Okay. Uh, next question, I guess then is, are there certain things that you should avoid saying or even doing around somebody with Alzheimer's and dementia? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I The number one piece of advice I give people is to live in their reality. Um, so even if that reality is kind of strange, um, even if that reality, which most of the time is not the same as our reality, just go with it. You know, so when my grandma... We were in Disney World and she, you know, talked about buying that shirt for Disney World. It does no good for me to, you know, say, well, grandma, no, we're in Disney World right now, right? 
it does no good for me to correct her. So I urge people, you know, live in their reality, try to avoid corrections. If you can, it won't really help. You know, they, they likely won't remember it anyway. So lots of patience and then avoid overly correcting them. It does really no good. So just kind of go along with what they say. Um, and then are there specific key care things that either a family member can do or even a caregiver if they're living with a family member um, that they can do when helping someone with a disease? Yeah, so um, a lot of those things, and we have specific programs, I should say too, and lots of resources on our site that go in much more depth than what I'll go into now. Um, but, you know, some of those symptoms of the disease come up for other reasons. So maybe someone living with Alzheimer's disease starts to become really, really irritable. And you think, well, yeah, they're just their brain's having a bad day. Check their physical comfort as well. Maybe they need to use the restroom and they don't know that they've forgotten to use the restroom. Um, maybe it's because they're cold because, you know, they're not wearing socks like they normally do. So my advice for caregiving is sometimes physical reactions um, to the disease come up in behaviors. So the more comfortable you can make them, the better. And also routines are, are really, really great for someone living with the disease um, and knowing what routine they prefer, um, what they like to do, really lean into creating moments of joy for them. If you know they love have always loved a cup of coffee in the morning, try your very best not to change that for them, right? Try to keep as much as what they have always loved into their life as possible. And then lastly, I know we talked about it before the webinar began that the month of June is for Alzheimer's awareness and everything. Are there certain programs that are taking place this month that people can get involved with as well? Yes, there's lots of programs listed on our site, but we are always looking for people to join our walk. Our walk isn't until October, but we encourage people to make a walk team um, and, you know, donate or join that day. You don't have to donate. You can just come and walk with us too. And then we also host in June our event called The Longest Day. So The Longest Day takes place on the summer solstice, which is the day with most light. Um, and it's a fundraising event that we host where you can do anything with, you know, sort of the idea that you do something that honors someone, you know, living with the disease or who has passed from the disease. And you spend that day with the most light doing something they loved. So, you know, we have pickleball teams, we have people rollerblading, we have people baking. Um, so I encourage you to look into, joining our walk or our longest day event as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so just real quick, we just wanted to point out to everybody um, what the Bureau has upcoming. On June 25th, we have uh, Protecting Your Business and Customers from Scams, and that's actually going to be uh, presented by the Federal Trade Commission. And then uh, just to let everybody know, as a reminder, September 24th will be our 27th annual Torch of Awards luncheon. Um, we have named the winners on our social media sites. So if you haven't seen who that was, please check out those sites and see who the winners are. Come out and celebrate those winners with us that day. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Sadie. Oh, sure. Um, here's my contact information. Again, I am Jenny. I am the programming communications manager here. So if you have any questions or see or like any events that you would like the Bureau to put on, please reach out to me. I would love to discuss those opportunities with you and see that what we can do either via webinar or either coming out and doing a presentation for you on different topics. Um, again, we want to thank all of you for participating today in the webinar. And if you know somebody or think possibly somebody might have Alzheimer's or dementia, we're hoping that this presentation helps you just a little bit. And if needed, you can always reach out to me and I can get you in contact with the Alzheimer's Association and with Sadie and give you her contact information too. 
We will be sending out that follow-up email with the link to the webinar, as well as the presentation and the sites that Sadie discussed. So it'll all be in there for you too. Lastly, we just have this QR code if you'd like to go ahead and scan it to do a quick survey for us. We are always striving to do better. So please fill out the survey. Let us know how this was for you today and what else we can do for you in the future. Um, Sadie, a special thank you to you for taking time out of your busy schedule, especially for this month of, of Alzheimer's awareness and presenting this to us and letting us know a little bit more about what we can do to help our family and friends around us with the disease. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yes. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you guys all soon. Bye. Bye.